You know, I, uh, you know, I think I will have a second cup of coffee. <laughs> I've been watching too much television while I've been off. Somebody bench your, somebody bench your cane. Boy, did you get a bad buy on that. <laughs> no, that's the original. That's the old gnarled root right there. Speaking of the old... <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> oh, your mind does strange things. How are you feeling? I have not seen Doc for... I was off this last week. I feel week. very well. You got, very the cast, very you got the cast off? Yes, we oh. smoked it last night. Never mind. <laughs> and it wasn't to, you bad. To, you have to use this for a couple of weeks now? Yes. Oh, it's uh, good to see you up and around. a few days on the cane, and then it's Foxtrot City. <laughs> ah. Ed is uh, off for a couple of days. Ed is uh, in, in a motion picture. That's right. Uh, one of those old army training films. <laughs> uh, no, he'll, I'm sure he'll tell you about it when he comes back. And then, it's nice to see you again. I'm Johnny Carson. Uh, <laughs> I'm your candidate for king of comedy. Uh, if, you, if you vote for me, I promise to give joke stamps to the poor and the unfunny. We might start here. Uh, how are you, Tom? Very well. It's good to see you. Now, there you see. That's the way you should dress when you're in front of the orchestra. Tom? Oh, yes, yes. You know, a nice, smart, simple blue suit. You look like a leader. How you feeling, anyway? Very well. Yeah, I'll, let, let me explain what happened. Um, we still have a doctor's slowdown in Southern California, but I understand this week a lot of the doctors are going back to work. And um, Tommy's doctor is still on strike, which is too bad because he was supposed to have surgery coming up this week. Um, he's having a brown shoe bypass. <laughs> Very tricky operation. Well, what can we talk about? Uh, did you see the pictures of the weather back east on the news the last couple of days? Terrible. You've got a feel for those people back there. Something like in New York, what they call the wind chill factor, with the temperature taking into account the wind, something like 40 degrees below zero. And they have to be a little envious when they look out here in Southern California, because the weather here has been incredibly beautiful. But we have a problem out here. We've had no rain since when? Well, it's been over four months. But it's been longer than that. We've had seven-tenths of an inch of rain since last April. What? It's been so long that I don't remember. I see. <laughs> it has been a dry out here. Let me tell you how dry oh, it's been. Never mind. Dry. No, no. Yes, it. One housewife was cleaning her bathroom. It's so dry. She found the tidy bowl man sitting in a dune buggy. It's, it's so dry, they caught a beaver trying to build a dam in Ronald Reagan's hair. It is very dry. Um, I have a historical note. But you know whose birthday it is today? It's Horace Greeley's birthday. He was born. Do you remember Horace Greeley? He was reputed to have said, go west, young man, go west. You realize if Horace Greeley hadn't been around, we'd just have parking spaces today? That's an educational joke. Now, let me, let me ask you this. Do you know who else's birthday it is today? No, 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 no. <laughs> Hudson Maxim. Does that name mean anything to you? No, he's not a Democratic candidate. Uh, oh, he might be. Who knows? Hudson Maxim was the inventor of high explosives. That's right. And he was born in 1853. Well, that's not too funny. It's educational. He is not well known today, but he was well known in his time because he was buried in five states. <laughs> How many of you knew yesterday was Groundhog Day? Puxatawney. Yeah. The, the, town, the town always bothers me. It's Puxatawney. <laughs> Catchy song. <laughs> Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. Yeah, the, the groundhog came out and uh, I guess saw its shadow, right? The groundhog came out here in California and uh, set up a deck chair and started drinking daiquiris. <laughs> It is dry out here. What else has happened? I, uh, did you see Sonny and Cher the other night? Sonny and Cher, as you may not know. I don't know how you could miss this. Um, they're a strange couple. Um, they were reunited on television in a new variety show called The Sonny and Cher Show. It's that kind of brilliant thinking that got us into Angola. Uh, you know, it's that they're in an interesting time slot. 
They're opposite the $6 million man. Isn't that a strange thing? The $20 million lawsuit versus the $6 million man. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be a hit or not. I think their marriage could have used a laugh track. See, that's a thing they play on television. <laughs> also, if the groundhog comes out and sees his shadow, also means you're going six weeks without laughs. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, now, here's... I'm going to fill you on things in the paper you might not have seen. Now, this was in, North, in Charlotte, North Carolina yesterday. Uh, said that the police broke up a phony drug ring. They were supposed to be selling cocaine. And you know what they found out it was? Foot powder. <laughs> yeah, people were buying and they thought it was cocaine and it was actually foot powder. And the problem was, anybody who sniffed it got a sudden desire to wear his head inside a boot. <laughs> Now, let's see what else is going on. Uh, Secretary of State's in town. Henry Kissinger is in town tonight. He arrived in Los Angeles. And where do you think the Secretary of State went to visit? It always intrigues me when uh, heads of government come out here. Where's the first place they go? Disneyland. He went out to saw Frontierland, Fantasyland, and uh, he denied reports that he was out here and he had ordered the CIA to give covert aid to Frontierland. <laughs> that is not true. He's not going to do that at all. <laughs> See, it takes me a little while to get rolling. I've been off a week, folks. Now, I'll talk about Richard Nixon is in the news again, and uh, he's kind of sad in a way. The state senate in Sacramento just put through a resolution. Did you know there was a Richard, Nixon, a Richard M. Nixon freeway yeah. here in Los Angeles? was yeah. Route 90. No longer. They put through a resolution. There is no longer a Richard Nixon freeway. It's now the Marina Freeway. And it's, uh, well, actually, you see what the problem is. That only leaves one other place that's named after him. It's the famous I Am Not a Crook State Beach. <laughs> uh, it's kind of sad. Now, this may be, if you saw this in the news the past week, this may be, so far, the year is fairly young, the strangest news item of the year came out of Chicago. There's a place back there that came out with a new kind of underwear. Those of you who read about it know I'm not making this up. What do you think it's made out of? Candy. Candy. <laughs> yes, they're making underwear. Oh, yes. <laughs> Called candy pants, and it's edible. <laughs> That's actually what they say. It's made out of the weirdest thing I have ever seen. <laughs> now, I've heard of a sweet tooth, but this is ridiculous. I mean, come on. The, uh, the M&M underwear melts in your pants, not in your mouth. It's <laughs> That's weird. I wanted to... They say the... Uh, they say the Carmel-centered underwear is brutal. I don't know. <laughs> you, that's true. Absolutely true. I'm not making it up. But uh, they say the worst, the toughest one to wear is, <laughs> is the Nestle Crunch briefs. I mean, if you want to... Shows you what's going on in this country. Underwear made out of candy, you know. This Valentine's Day ought to be great. <laughs> People be sending skivvy grams all over the country. <laughs> For older citizens, I don't know whether this was in the news or not, but for the... <laughs> older citizens, they have prune suppos. Did you know that's weird? Well, that's what's been happening in the news lately. But tonight, you're in a good mood. We have Mr. Raymond Burr is with us tonight. We have... Funny, inventive gentleman, Robert Klein, is here tonight. We have... A gentleman by the name of Tom Burnham, who's written the most uh, interesting book, and the title is The, um, the Dictionary of Misinformation, in which he kind of tries to set the record straight on a lot of, uh, we call them facts and myths that we tend to believe in. For example, like Betsy Ross, right, made the American flag. Would you say that's true? I thought it was. According to him, that's not true. Lots of things like that. Will he tell us who actually made it? I, I don't know, but that was just, a, just an illustration. <laughs> Did you know that, Tom, that Betsy Ross did not make the American flag? Levi Strauss made it. Levi Strauss. 
there you are. Levi Strauss made it. <laughs> and uh, a lovely lady who was with us last year on her birthday. Today, I understand, is actually her birthday. She is back. And what is fascinating, her name is Maud Tull. And Miss Tull tonight is cel Mrs. Tull is celebrating her 104th birthday. And she is with us tonight. She's a lovely lady. So thank you for coming and with you. Been out of practice a little bit, huh? It must have been the suit. Must have been the suit. Is, is, is there anything... Is there anything better than hot, home-baked Pillsbury cinnamon rolls with icing? You bet there is. No, listen. <laughs> Nice to be back. Yes, it's nice to it have you back. Did you I have think, a nice vacation? I did. I didn't do anything at all. Played that's some tennis. Got that's the best way. Set home and relax. And, you know, cleaned out my sock drawer. <laughs> big, big vacation. Well, we missed you. Less people think I made that up. That is true about the uh, the candy pants, edible underwear, and they're selling it. That could it's be, true. They're that selling could be dangerous. it. Five dollars and fifty cents a pair. Um, says a lot of buyers are college students, but there have been people also in their fifties and sixties. They're wearable. They look like plastic pants for infants. The only difference is they are tasty. <laughs> Where are we headed, folks? Uh, put in water, they disappear. Left out of their freshness bag, they become brittle. Left out, in the, left out in the cold, they freeze, which brings up other interesting possibilities, too. But... You have to be careful. If you wore a pair of those and went out with an oversex diabetic, you could be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take two pairs of these and call me in the morning. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, it brings up all kinds of... Uh, Old Ironsides is with us tonight. Yeah, yeah. Raymond Burr is with us tonight. And, uh... Also, uh, Robert Klein. You think you'll lay down rubber tonight? Mm, no, you still remember that joke, don't you? <laughs> One of my all-time favorites. Yeah. I'm trying to remember that joke. Um, it, was a, it was a... A new episode of a television show. Uh, and we were reading, uh, coming up for the, for the television season, and it was when Raymond Burr was doing Ironside. And the episode was, Ironside goes on the water diet and lays rubber to the men's room. And you've never, you've <laughs> never, never forgotten that, have you? That's my favorite. I've obviously, most of you have forgotten it, and probably this is What a thing, then. Here's an item from the, uh, obviously, from the newspaper by Jack Houston. I don't know what paper this is. Anybody know? Looks like the Los Angeles Times, I assume. Telling you when you're going to be fired. There are little signs that apparently occur before people are going to be let go from their jobs. And it says, some of the more obvious signs you're about to lose your job include some or all of your duties are taken away. You're giving, given rotating assignments instead of a permanent position. The more subtle signs include you're sent to personnel to talk about your career goals. <laughs> you're, you, you're excluded from meetings and receiving office memos. Your boss and his peers stop inviting you to lunch or coffee. Your boss becomes more critical of your performance and increases his supervision of your work. He's too busy to see you. Little signs. More devious tell tell say signs are you're relocated from Southern California to North Dakota. <laughs> you're moved into smaller quarters inside the company. You're relieved of your secretary. You know, and if you read these, this will tell you when you're going to be I don't know what that is in the L.A. Times. I'm mm -hmm. not sure what paper that is from, but yeah. it, it's, a, it's amazing. What's that? And in these times of high unemployment, that you would happen to find an article in a newspaper. Look, the size of that article. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Small as that article is right there. That article will tell you everything. I mean, if there's anything you want to know about losing your job, it's in this article. Ev everything you want to know. Well, you're wrong, Bugle Breath. Let me tell you something. <laughs> uh, here's some signs. Here's some definite signs you'll know if you're going to lose your job. When you arrive at the office in the morning, your desk is on fire. <laughs> When the men's room key they give you is to the shell station down the street. <laughs> when they replace your Xerox machine with a Polaroid camera. <laughs> 
If they move you out of a large office with a window and move you into a small office that stops at every floor. <laughs> if you find a horse's head in your parking space. <laughs> the boss takes you to lunch and the olive in your martini starts ticking. Little suggestions. When they remove your fluorescent lights and replace them with a firefly and a whip. <laughs> when the boss tells you your new sales territory is the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> Little subtle ones. When you push the button on your intercom and it's connected to Henny Youngman's dial a joke. <laughs> when your stenographer takes your dictation sitting on somebody else's lap. <laughs> When your paycheck is printed on a sumo wrestler's arm. That's weird, weird. When your boss questions your expense account and demands a receipt for the dime you spent in the pay toilet. <laughs> Those are just some of the reasons. Not all. No, 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 not, and not all of it. Now, we have tonight Raymond Burr is with us, Robert Klein, Tom Burnham, and a, a lovely lady you will meet in a moment who's celebrating, and this is no joke. People usually think we're setting something up, but she was with us last year, if you remember. Maud Tull, who still drives her own car, an electric car, by the way. And she was, she was pictures in the paper the other day, wasn't it? Or in the LA Times or one of the papers, they did a story. She will join us in just a moment after we have this short commercial. The last time Maud Tull... Thank you. Thank you, Tom. The last time Maud Toll was with us, she had just passed her driver's license examination on her 103rd birthday to renew her license. She, she leads an active life, and we asked her if she would come back on her birthday, and she was very kind. And she is with us tonight. Would you welcome, please, 104 years old. It's her birthday today, Maud Toll. <laughs> Mr. Severinsen will help you there. You How just sit you? down and make yourself... Oh, so nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Sit down right here, Maude. How's that? Okay? Yes. All right, I'll come back over here. How are you, dear? Oh. Good to see you. I'm glad to be down here. I'm having a good time. Are you really? I'm celebrating. Celebrating? It's my birthday, you know. 104 years old? Four. 104. Yeah. Happy, can I give you a kiss? What? Can I give you a little kiss? Happy birthday. I think you're wearing that tigress perfume tonight, Maud. What have you done today to celebrate? Well, I don't really know. I haven't done very much of anything. Yeah? I'm kind of getting ready for a driver's license tomorrow. You have to go back and renew the driver's license again? Yeah. Well, you passed last year. You passed the exam, right? Yes. I, they don't let you have it but a year at a time. Well, well, when you're 103, you uh, <laughs> might be thinking ahead a little bit. Uh, <laughs> now, do you, um, you have to take your automobile, your car, to the uh, motor no. vehicles, or do they come out to see no. you? I have to go to the office and take my tests like you do. The written test? Mm -hmm. And then you have to go out and drive the car? No, they the come out and have me drive where, where I use it. Mm-hmm. So it only goes, what, 20 miles an hour? Well, yes. <laughs> Don't go very fast. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that, you know. Yeah, you mentioned that because... <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you tell me last time you were here that you don't... you don't completely charge the battery because if somebody steals the car, they won't be able to get too far from where they picked it up? Oh, I never do. Yeah, I just kind of put a half charge on it uh -huh. and... Yeah. That's a good... <laughs> they don't want no car with it they can't pull yeah. away, you know, because there's not so many of them in the country. There's a lot of them down around Long Beach, but not out there. Yeah. Well, it would be kind of be kind of <laughs> difficult, wouldn't it, to sell an electric car? I mean, if somebody did steal it, it'd be pretty recognizable, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I ever see Cal Worthington in front of an electric car, I'll, I'll, I'll know where he got it. Uh, now, what, what is your test like? You have to take the written exam? 
Uh, the written exam. Mm -hmm. Do you know all the rules? Well, no, not all of them. <laughs> I've got to know enough, though, to pass the examination. Yeah. Can I give you a little quiz to see if you... If you remember some of the questions? Well, I don't know. You might. Yeah. All right. Now, suppose... <laughs> okay, now, these aren't any trick questions now. Suppose you came up to an intersection, a stop sign, and you stopped. And another car came to your right and stopped at the same time. Now, who would have the right of way? Well, the fall on the right would. Well, if I have a question like that tomorrow, I'll know that that's the right answer. I don't think you'll have any trouble at all. <laughs> when did you first drive? You didn't drive, though, did you? Uh, until uh, later in life? Yeah, no. Yeah. How old were you when you first drove an automobile? Well, sir, I, I just don't know. Yeah. I've forgotten what it was. Yeah. But I... I see, I drove... Um, a Dodge car. That's right. Well, I got a Dodge. a Dodge when I bought it. I didn't have to drive because I had a, a brother, a son, or not, he wasn't a son, but he lived with us all the time, and he was a great driver. Yeah. And then, of course, you men don't like women are driving when they want to drive. Well, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> I so, think women drive. But after, after I... Uh, lost my husband and my brother. Why, well, you know, it was time for me to... I didn't want to sit in a chair all the time. No. You keep active, don't you? You still go to work every day? Yes. Yeah. Now, you've, you've been drawing Social Security for a couple of years, haven't you? What? You get Social Security every... Uh... Oh, yes. That's all I get off of the government. <laughs> Give it to him. Uh, you can get to sit with us a while and talk. We have to do a commercial. Uh, you get to see our show at night? Are you in bed uh, when we go on the air at 11.30 at night? Well, yes, I most always am. Most, uh, most asleep usually? Usually. You're in bed already. Mm -hmm. Do you think you might stay up tonight to see it? Well, I might. The, uh, <laughs> the girls are, are waiting for me to come and see it. The I girls are work. waiting for you. But huh? I don't <laughs> no, you, you stay up tonight for a while and watch it, okay? All we'll right. do the, We'll do the commercial. We'll come right back and talk some more. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy, and welcome back. We're talking with uh, Maud Tull, who's celebrating her birthday today. What do you think of our orchestra? Do you like the, you like the music nowadays? Yes, I do. Did you hear? Mm -hmm. That's good. That's fine. Yeah. I enjoy it. Yeah. To think to have it out like on my birthday. Oh, yes. We had the band especially here for your birthday tonight. <laughs> <laughs> they play lots of birthday parties. <laughs> you know, last time you were with us, I asked you um, what kind of a diet you had, what kind of food, remember? And you said that you love pies. You remember? Uh -huh. You still eat a lot of pies? Yeah. We got a whole bunch for your birthday tonight. All the, no, you said you love pies and you had pie every day. We got all of these for you to take home tonight. Oh. You remember? Oh. So those you are make all... me hungry to look at those. What? You make me hungry to look there. Well, those are all... Well, those, have one over here, I those are all for you to take home. We'll have them put in your car and well, sent I'll home for you. Rain. Now, don't you do what I think you'd like to do. Oh. Don't you dare do that on your birthday. Yeah. Put that right Say, there. <laughs> I'll get away from that part. <laughs> you know, you look like you feel very well. What? You look like you feel very well. You, you feeling, you're feeling good? Sure. Yeah? Oh, I feel good all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get a few little aches and pains, uh, I suppose, as, as everybody does as they get older? Well, I'm supposed to have, but I don't... No, I don't pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good idea. You know, if you don't think about it, why, well, then you don't... You forget you've had a pain. I really no, I don't feel as if I ever did have a pain. That's good. That's a good attitude. <laughs> Power of positive thinking, right? Uh-huh. You got uh, to... <laughs> do you ever have a little, um... 
I, I've heard that when people get older, they need less sleep at night. Is that true? You don't require, you know, like eight hours sleep, but you sleep less as you get older. Well, I don't know. I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm getting younger, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I, I don't... You take little naps in the sleep afternoon? sleep at a time. Can you? Mm -hmm. You can just lie down and doze off any time you want to? Yes, I can. Well, that's good. That is, unless I've got something I want to do. Got yeah. to do for Ames Mortgage or some of you fellas. Well, that's right. You work for Ames Mortgage Company, don't you? <laughs> well, you go out and foreclose on people when they want their... <laughs> they... <laughs> well, <laughs> they do that. I don't you have You didn't to. do that. No, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> you, now, you've, you've lived a long time. It, of all the modern conveniences that we have today, the appliances and so forth, what do you think you'd least likely to be able to do without? I mean, the thing that would really be important. Any one item that uh, you'd like to have, I mean, that you you couldn't do without? Like a washing machine, a, a telephone, well, a car. Well, I don't car. want a washing machine because I'd rather go out and take it, my washing to the wash house or the, where I live. It, you take it down and put it in the... In the... I put it in the washer, and they, they take care of it itself, and then I don't bother to hang up the clothes, and I just throw them in the dryer and let that go. I don't... That's too much work. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Do you, do you ever have a little glass of wine or something? They say wine is good for the blood. It keep, thins it out a little bit. And... I don't know. No, you, I, no, I don't. You don't drink at all? I don't drink, no. Did you ever drink? It's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, but you've never had a, a little liquor at any time in your life? Oh, oh I come on now. don't know that I have. When you were younger, when you were courting, did you ever have a little flask or something and just a little... I, I don't remember. Well, I don't that must have been good stuff. <laughs> You see, I have a, that kind of a memory. I don't aim to remember a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. that, that kind of comes in handy. No. Well, no trick at all. You yeah. can do it. Now, in this article I read about you in the paper, it said that you, you like younger men. You like to be with younger people. Of course, it's difficult for you to be with older people because they're... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and what, what age, of, what age do you like people to be around? I mean, what, what would you call a young person? Well, I, I don't know that I particularly would like to be around a real young person. I think older people like you fellas are better. <laughs> to see the girls tonight. <laughs> Older people like us, huh? Yes. Yeah, I think uh -huh. you're right. <laughs> now, you've been a, you were a, you've been a widow for about 14 years? Yes. Was there any time that you thought of getting remarried? No, I've been too busy. Yeah? <laughs> well, it doesn't take too long, I mean, you know, to get married. You'd never reconsider getting, getting married again. No, I hadn't. No, no. Yeah. I, I've had uh, enough trouble without having any more. You've had enough trouble without any more. <laughs> enough is enough, right? <laughs> now, you probably get this question. Any, any time somebody gets to be 100 years old and over, they always ask the question, what, what's your philosophy of life? And uh, it, I know you probably get tired of that question, but it's interesting. How, do you have any particular philosophy of, uh, of getting along and being happy or... Well, I was uh, trained when I was a little kid that if I didn't work and keep busy, I'd have to go to the poorhouse when I got old. And I've always tried to keep out of there.
In other words, work and stay out of the poorhouse, and that'll do it, huh? Yeah. That's pretty that good philosophy. That's what my dad always Your dad told said. you that? He says, well, if you don't pull weeds, we would live down a big farm. Uh huh. And he, in the garden, why, he wanted us kids. I it was just two of us. And he wanted us to learn to work. Right. And so that poorhouse was the worst place you, we thought we could possibly go to. I never was there, but then on the way I never got there. Don't just kept pulling those weeds, huh? <laughs> no, I can... I'd rather pull weeds. Yeah. You don't look now. They say that also when people get older that they, they're subject to, to being lonely. I don't think you're probably lonely at all. You probably have a good many friends, don't you? You spend time with? Well, I don't, I don't have too much time to spend. But then they, I've got uh, quite a few friends, I think. Uh huh. Do you get together and play cards and. I, oh, well, I was, yes, I'm not a good card player, though. Aren't you? Uh-uh. I... You play for money? No. I, I would lose all I had then. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I, I never, I couldn't, I learned, I don't think I started to learn to play cards young enough. Yeah. Somebody told me that you didn't start to swim until you were 85. Is that true? Yes. Why did you take up swimming at 85? I mean, obviously not for the Olympics. <laughs> uh, but... Well, everybody, everybody then, though, I was where I could get in the water, you know. Mm -hmm. I got no water to go into now, or the bathtub. <laughs> and that's not deep enough. Not deep enough, yeah. No. Uh -uh. So no. you, you took up swimming at, 80, at 85? Mm -hmm. I guess. Just, well, just for the that. exercise? Huh? Mm -hmm. Just, but I want, I like to go with the crowd that went there, you know. And well, that's where the crowd was going at 85. <laughs> <laughs> they, I wasn't as old as... That must have been some crowd going swimming at 85. <laughs> well, they was really younger. We had a drill team. Mm-hmm. A drill team? It... Yeah. Yeah, water drill team? Oh, no. No, but they, we had a drill team, and they was all younger than I was. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you're a fascinating lady. Would you make me a promise that you come back here on your next birthday? Yes. And spend an evening with us? Yeah. I'll be back here with you. I hope you are. <laughs> and I thank you for coming, Lord. We're back. Raymond Burr. Raymond Burr is a fine, fine actor, made many motion pictures, and I suppose his biggest successes uh, have been on television in two smash series, uh, Perry Mason, and uh, I don't know how many years, seven or eight years, and then Ironsides, of course. He was nominated for four Emmys. He uh, was awarded two. And uh, Tuesday night on NBC, Tuesday night mystery movie on February the 8th at 9, he's, he's one of the stars as the star. A show called Mallory, Circumstantial Evidence. Would you welcome, please, Mr. Raymond Burr. <laughs> I was waiting for you to come over and get me. <laughs> Isn't she fascinating? She is. I saw her last year on your show. She's it's just fabulous. incredible. And uh, I think, as his doc was saying, it takes her a little while to kind of warm up to the situation. And then the mind gets into high gear, and she's very amusing. I hope we do as well. Wouldn't you like to? I, I wonder sometime. 104. No, we won't make it. Don't think so. <laughs> I don't, don't think so. We have not seen you for my... I, well, it's got to be six, seven years. Just about. New York was the last That's time. That's right. You're looking super. So are you. Yeah. So are you. How many years did you do, Perry Mason? I nine, said se nine, nine years. Nine. And Ironside? Went Eight. Seventeen years and two series. Well, that's the <laughs> In television, uh, you know, if, if a show gets on for two or three four seasons is considered a hit, but that's a, that's kind of a track record. I itself. first met you at RKO, and I was just wondering the other night uh, how long you would have been in movies had you stayed in movies instead of going back to New York. Uh, that was 1949. <laughs> uh, I was over at Maud's house at that time. We were, <laughs> we were tying one on together. Uh, now you're going to play an attorney again, right? Yes, uh, for the uh, two-hour show. Um, it was it was an interesting uh, 
idea. I don't know whether we're going on with it from there. Yeah. But you never know. This is a, a hope for intended series. Uh, well, I'm going to do two or three. Uh, another one, I think, in February, which is a different kind of character. We haven't really leveled in yet. Uh, do you like be, playing attorneys? Could be any one of the three. Yeah. Do you like playing attorneys? I liked playing the last two right. that I did. No, all three, I think. I did one in motion pictures. And, uh, and, uh... You never lost, though, did you, in Perry Mason? Three cases. You lost three? Yes, we lost three. That's one percent. We did 300 shows. <laughs> uh, that's about the How right, did you manage right to percentage. lose... How did you manage to lose three cases? It wasn't easy. <laughs> Um, is, uh, is, is Mallory anything at all? Well, of course it probably is, because they're two different characters, the Perry Mason. We have, we have a film clip, I believe, don't we? Not a short excerpt from the show coming up? Why don't we show that and give us an idea what the, what the show is about? I don't know what, what side of the show I don't this either. is. So, uh, I, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll be surprised together. Uh, yeah. Bobby, want to run it and we'll... Uh... Why did the deal fall through? A certain neurotic DA found out why I was making it. He took it personally and wouldn't treat Ruiz's case separately from his co-defendants. So you're saying that you won't call Ruiz? At this stage, one of two things would happen. He'd lie on the stand. If the jury bought it, your nephew would be on the way to being convicted. If I could break Ruiz down, then I've killed him. All of a sudden, we've stopped mentioning my nephew. One human life has as much... And what do you mean, if you could break him down? Of course you could. All you gotta do is testify to what he told you. A lawyer's word against a prison. I don't tell me a jury wouldn't buy that. Exactly. How does that help Ruiz? Let me tell you something, partner. My interest in Ruiz goes only so far. Splendid. I've heard of a day late and a dollar short. Where was all your interest when it might have done some good? Who put Joe in there in the first place? Well, this is the second place. And maybe I gotta move this thing for now on myself. I've been doing a little research on you, partner. You made me nervous from the beginning, and now I know why. And it looks like you haven't learned a thing since. Fix a witness. They'll always catch you. There's no time for this rubbish now. That's right, there's no time. I'm not going to let my sister's kid go in there where the guy is marked lousy. I hire a lawyer who doesn't spend all his time in a bargain basement. Who will do what? Who will put Ruiz on the stand whether he wants it or not. And who will put you on so the jury knows exactly what happened. You can't do that. Oh, I can't. If I testify in open court that Ruiz told me the truth. You have put a gun in my hand, aimed it at his head, and made me pull the trigger. Mallory, you don't scare me. But don't put me in that kind of box. Don't ask me to kill him. Goodbye. Your Honor? You had curly hair there. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I went to, uh, for a slight operation afterwards to the hospital, so... With that curly hair was uh, a good idea at the time, but it was pretty hard to take care of. <laughs> Could, couldn't make it. I had it cut off. You, wanted, you, wanted, you did a, show, a picture once with, with, with Papard. We were Snow White. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Rear Window. A couple of times I've had... The uh, one with Papard was... I had fairly short hair, and they kept bleaching it. And it, uh, I started out with my hair, and I ended up with a hairpiece because it all fell and out. Ruined the hair. <laughs> You know, I was thinking of something when, when I see playing attorneys. Uh, have you ever been on the stand yourself in any kind of a court action? I have, or, or deposition or something. It's <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to get personal, but I want to tell you, when you are under deposition or you are on the stand, it is one of the most harrowing experiences in the world, no matter how cool you think you are, because skilled attorneys can make somebody feel like you wish you'd never been born. Uh, they most certainly can. I was only once, and that was, uh, I had to fly on a federal case to New Mexico on a land sale that somebody made, a big land right. deal. And uh, so I appeared for the government on it, but uh, the uh, attorneys on the other side, right, they... It took me about five or ten minutes to find my voice, you know, before I could answer any questions. I they, think it's They kept saying, speak louder. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then they always take and paraphrase something. They say, am I correct in assuming that on this particular date you did at no time mention to so-and-so or have any conversations with him pertaining to the said issue or that you did not repeat what was said? And you go, uh, you have the, you have the slightest idea what the hell he said. I wonder why they can't come out and say, 
uh, yes or no things, but they can make you seem like you've just got out of grade school. In Mason, I used to have speeches like that that went on for a page and a half, and somebody would always say yes or no. And yeah, and then answer it, <laughs> yes, that is absolutely true. You, uh, oh, we have to take a short break here, but we're coming right back, and I want to see how your, your island's doing. Fine. That, that fascinates Fine. me. We'll be right back. Freddie DeCord and the just came up. Freddie DeCord to mention something I found rather interesting about Maud Tull. Do you realize she was here for the centennial of this country? Yeah. Celebrated the first hundred years, and she's here for the bicentennial. That's kind of weird. Uh, or we talk your island. You have an island. Um, I don't know you have it or you own it or you you live there in the Fiji somewhere. In yes, in the eastern part of Fiji. Uh, it's a plantation and. Uh, a great place to go. We raise coconut and cattle and uh, orchids, which is kind of a nice cross-section of things to do. You, uh, go there, you go there often? About twice a year. Yeah. Not long enough each trip, but... Uh, That's the I'm, dream when everybody, you know, I guess grows up says, I'd like to get away from it and go to an island. How long can you stay there before you get a little bit bored? Well, I have never been there long enough to be bored. There is always things to do. People are wonderful. Uh, it's one of the reasons I kind of settled there. The Fijian people are extraordinary human yeah. beings as a race of people. And uh, much more civilized, I think, than we are. Right. They have a great deal of respect for one another <laughs> as people. But there is every, you know, there's everything there. We, I, I it's modern, modern art? Well, we have, uh, we finally have some indoor toilets. Uh, and we have electricity now. That kind of takes the fun out of it, though. I remember in the Midwest, well, I don't suppose it's important. Well, of course, we didn't have the severe... Uh, it was something of a challenge in the we Midwest. Didn't have, we didn't have the severe weather situation that you used to have in Nebraska. That's down true. It never gets below 70 degrees. However, uh, it's better, I think, with a little electricity and a little air conditioning from time to time. Right. Here's a question that you've been asked. I know about iron size, and you probably are sick to death of answering it. But did you ever get a little bit bugged of having to do that whole show sitting down all the time? Did it ever limit you in, in areas that you wanted to go in the, in, in the show and weren't able to because of that limitation? Yes, I'm not a very good sitter anyway. So uh, uh, if I start standing immediately, well, you'll understand. Uh, <laughs> Just get up any time you feel like Thank you. Uh, I, I really don't. I'm not that, comfortable sitting. So that... that uh, but when you think of the people that have to, certainly around yeah. the world, why uh, it uh, gives you pause to think. Yeah. I did not do well sitting. Uh, as, as you want to get up and move all the time? Yes. Yeah. But it's funny. I, I did one show that was a flashback, and you finally work on timing as an actor. I did one show with a flashback where Ironside was up walking around in the show. Before the, uh, uh, you know, and the accident. And I got up and did that scene. And I couldn't time it walking, and so I. You because know. you're so used to taking the pace so in the chair. So used to doing this in the pace in the, in the wheelchair. That's very interesting. Well, I hope they, I hope this show for you, Mallory, is uh, goes on if it's successful, and if you want to continue, I, I assume that you like to keep active because anybody who's done too serious that long and, and been in the business you long as, as long as you have wants to wants to keep working. I uh, well yes I. I it's like Maud says, you know, it keeps you out of the poorhouse too. Yeah, <laughs> that it does. That, that it does. does. It it uh, all helps. I like the divided life. I like life outdoors and in Fiji working on the farm and uh, certainly my job uh, whatever it might be in this business here it's a great combination yes it is don't spend seven years next time come back and see us oh I know well let's take a break Robert Klein is with us and also a gentleman by the name of Tom Burnham with a fascinating book the dictionary of misinformation after this I always look forward to Robert Klein's visits because he is a, he's one of the more inventive performers working around today. Rather than just telling a series of jokes, per se, he comes out and makes comments on the absurdities of life. Would you welcome, please, Robert Klein. Members of the faculty, fellow students, uh, I'm just getting my neck straightened out from... Uh, 
two weeks trial run of the Evelyn Wood speed reading course. You ever see that advertisement? These students are actually studying. In, <laughs> even in Hebrew. You know, they go, anyway, can you get every nuance, every and and or and but and participle when you're speed reading? I'd love to read everything ever written, but uh, I don't know. When you're coming around that Evelyn Wood paragraph at 60 miles an hour, what does an and or an or mean? It becomes, Nwah! They teach it in medical schools, too, which frightens me. I don't want my doctor learning that way. The liver! I notice there are green exit signs here, and all the times I've done the shows. That's a peculiar, isn't it, Johnny? Usually have red exit signs. They mean alert. Red is, hey, alert, fire this way, you know. Green is a kind of layback exit sign. There's a fire if you want to get out. Come this way. <laughs> if you don't want to get out. Have you noticed the, uh, there's a lot of talk about the family hour on television, I think it's, uh, what is it, uh, eight to nine or something like that. An awful lot of animal shows. Have you noticed that the original animal show that I remember is Marlon Perkins on Sunday afternoon, live from Chicago, Lincoln Park Zoo with Jim Hurlbut, a staff announcer. Uh, you know, uh, look at this rhinoceros, uh, so forth. Uh, they used to handle these animals live and the announcer was afraid of animals, and it was very humorous. Look at this boa constrictor, Jim. It's not at all slimy as people imagine. No, Marlon, it's not slimy. No. <laughs> the snake thinks he's a goat. Uh, Marlon takes fewer chances now. I still like the guy, but come on. He's always in a helicopter chasing a polar bear for 11 miles. And they always have to tag the poor thing. If you look at that popo there, it looks like a pin cushion. Everyone's tagging this polar bear. And, you know, National Geographic, 1951, 52, 53. Marlon Perkins, 68 through 60. Johnny Loves Mary. Everything is written on that poor polar bear. Do they really have to tag the thing? You know? Well, some of the bad ones, there's been a real proliferation of some bad animal shows where they put in a lousy soundtrack. They just grab music off a shelf and it's inappropriate to the nature film. You're seeing this incredible undersea tropical shot of fish and you hear These blowfish certainly know a good meal on the coral. Jacques Cousteau has the sublime music for water. You know, the tentacles of the octopus flowed in the natural current, bling, plong, with that liquid music that makes you want to go to the wee -wah, you know? <laughs> and of course, there's dopey music for animals that human beings consider dopey, like wop, wop, wah, you know, like bears and penguins. Whoop, 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 boy. That's one penguin that won't toy with an angry pelican again. Wop, wop, wah. <laughs> And Lauren Green is always making these assumptions about the animal's feelings. I resent that, you know? <laughs> Anthropomorphism, giving human traits to animals, you know, these storks, a whole episode about storks. During the nest building, a feeling of joy and anticipation. How does he know? <laughs> what, did he go over to them? How are you feeling? <laughs> joy, anticipation, you know, I mean, I... <laughs> At least it's better than the cartoons. When I was a kid, I was brought up in Disney. But, uh, uh, you know, Disney portrayed animals as they really aren't. A fox is sneaky, a bear is always a big friendly guy. I'm a bear. A little with a nice big black velvety nose that you want to go Can I do that again? Sure, Robert. You know, kind of a dope. Uh, and yet, ironically, Disney Studios was responsible for the greatest nature footage ever. Remember, uh, the Living Desert and all those other ones. I read in Life magazine once they waited for a month and a half in a marsh in Canada for the geese to take off in a certain formation that, you know. But today, you see these nature films, you see the elk look up in the alert posture, you know, they don't have the patience to wait in a month and a half. They throw a rock at his head. <laughs> you see the geese take off, that one's easy. They go, ah! <laughs> geese take off very well for you. And they cover it later by adding a soundtrack. <laughs> all kinds of... It's an illusion. Film itself is an illusion. I go to a lot of colleges and I perform, and everyone knows how movies are made, you all know, but yet we don't know it. The illusion is still fabulous. Like there's a dog food commercial that you see around, uh, which is a perfect example. It's filmed and they put this food down in San Francisco and the lady's dog eats the food and she's genuinely amazed. Well, I can't believe it. He's so finicky. Normally, just shrimp cocktails. I can't. <laughs> a nickel a serving? Wow, and the dog is eating the bowl at this point. He loves it. You know, and I, what a great commercial. And I thought, wait a minute. They showed you the one that worked. 
You know? How about the outtakes? How about the 2,000 other, other dogs you'll never see who looked at that food and went, get that out of my sight immediately. <laughs> what is this? Yeah. <laughs> you'll never see that, where the film crew got so discouraged, you know, cut! When will we ever find a dog to eat this garbage? What is this, dog repellent? You know, I mean, you saw the one that worked. Now, I know about illusions in, in film, because I've been in several films. They haven't done all that well. Uh, the last film I did is on a double feature in very shady movies in the bad parts of town. Right now, there's one in Far Rockaway playing on a double bill with Kill Me, Whip Me, Hurt Me, Throw Me. <laughs> and Sailor's Revenge. But, uh... <laughs> now, uh, there was, in fact, a love scene. Can you imagine a love scene? And, uh, they didn't... Uh, my co-star did not want to work nude. Joan Hackett. She didn't want to work nude. Now, uh... <laughs> I have to do a love scene without showing any of the, uh, I don't know how to, the genitalia. That's a Marlon Perkins word, isn't it? The genitalia sometimes forage with the antelope and the... <laughs> it's an underutilized word, isn't it? But anyway, I'm, uh, she didn't want to work nude, and I'm far too hip and avant-garde to care about such a silly thing. After all, this is the 20th century, and it's just the human body. You know what I mean? I thought to myself, they want to shoot me, Newt. I mean, it's just a body. What's the big deal? Until I realized it would be my behind, 28 feet tall in a drive-in movie. <laughs> where a hair becomes a pine tree. <laughs> where a, where a, a piece of fat becomes a bunker. Where a mole really becomes a mountain. The only time it ever does. Thank you very much. Love your stuff. Thank you, Johnny. It's been a long time since. Yeah, it has. Disney is interesting because you're right. He did, in a way, do a disservice to animals. Sure. Because he's given the qualities to snakes. They're vicious and so forth. They're, they're friendly animals. We they're found nice out ones. that wolves are very loyal. You know, wolves have always been portrayed as vicious, but uh, oh, they sneaky, take care of cunning, their... Oh, cunning, yeah. That's right. They take care of their own and all that. Let me do this first. We'll be right back. We're, we're doing it right now. Back. Bob and I were talking. Uh, I think we share a common reaction to the bicentennial celebration. We're almost bicentennial out, and that is nothing, not being unpatriotic to the country. But I get the impression that 200 years ago, when they started, somebody was looking ahead, <laughs> saying, Do you realize in 200 years we can make a real killing here by selling plaques and beer mugs and coins and little marks? Did you see one of the places in town that's advertising a radio for 1995? And on top of it, in sculptured metal, what is sculptured metal? Not gold, but sculptured metal. There's the, uh, the, the drum player and the revolutionary thing. 1976. Spirit of 76. Spirit of 76 on top of a radio. Well, I was a history political science major. I've always been interested in history. And the thing that I th think about it is that these men risked, unlike Nixon's and Agnew's uh, and those kind of guys, uh, Washington, as pompous as he may have been, and Hamilton and Jefferson, they would have been hung had the British prevailed. There's no question about it. Yeah. And uh, you see a commercial with Paul Revere warning everyone, 40% off! You know, I mean, it really sends chills down your spine, doesn't it? Uh, I mentioned on the air, but you would love this. I was up in Scottsdale once, and I saw a half gallon of whiskey for 1776. Now, you know, they're, everything they can do is to get yes. it in there. I think it's, uh, it was predictable, but unfortunate. I have a personal pet peeve, I think you, you partly share, about the national anthem. Yeah, I love this. Well, you know, uh, uh, the national anthem was only the national anthem uh, since 1936 or 7, something like that. Uh, I think it should be America the Beautiful, which is A, more singable. Yeah. And it's a nice pastoral poem about what America is all about, the natural rich beauty and the people. Uh, first, the National Anthem is a great uh, instrumental, but a poor singing song. I mean, it's embarrassing. Opera singers can't cut it at ball games. <laughs> and the rockets will you know, it's... <laughs> There's a song a, about a three-octave change, isn't it? <laughs> or else you have to start very low to get there. Well, it was written for a goose, that tune. I've never sang it in one octave. <laughs> you try to fool it, you know. Oh, say, It catches you. And the I've reversed it. I've gone, oh, say, can. 
and the rye. <laughs> now, for one thing, people don't know, it was an old English drinking tune. It has no great American origins. It's an English drinking right. tune, and those things are not written by Mozart's on a day off. They evolve for hundreds of years through drunks. <laughs> I mean, I'll pinch the wenches behind. <laughs> Let's go to London down. I mean, I don't know how it started. Uh, the and you poem. can sing it when you're drunk. You could probably it's get up there It's the only time you sing. can reach the note, or in extreme pain. <laughs> Hernia uh, patients can sometimes sing it. Uh, <laughs> The other thing is that if you bother to read the poem, the lyrics are written by a man eminently qualified to write lyrics for any tune. He was an attorney in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Who, by the way, gets credit for words and music. You know, a lot of people forget Hal David. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, he didn't write the music. <laughs> not that it's a great... It's not a bad instrumental. You can get a lot of... Tommy, what do you call those in music? You know what I mean? Ratatata. That's, 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 that's the technical explanation for it. That's what I thought it was. Um, it is a poem about a battle, right. which I don't approve of anyway, but more in bad days, about a battle which we lost. And if you look at the, you know, the 18, War of 1812, I was taught in school, we won to, come on, the British did a few little numbers before they left, burned Washington. You know, they just smothered us, and a guy named Napoleon was giving them a hard time in Europe, and they had to pull out. But uh, the poem is about this battle off the coast of Baltimore, in which, you know, and the theme of the poem is that the flag was still there. Uh, yippee, the fort was pulverized. <laughs> Everybody in it was dead. And this maniac is yelling, but the flag is still there! But the flag is still there! The British must have... Get this idiot out of here, Sergeant Major. And the phrasing is moronic. It starts, oh, oh, say, you know, like it was a 50s rock tune. Oh, oh, darling, you know. Oh, 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 you know, instead of, oh, oh, so. It's not the most important bicentennial suggestion in the country, well, but uh, I wouldn't mind seeing it change. Now, really. don't be overly chauvinistic and write in and saying we're being unpatriotic. Well, it's so been in Congress a number of times, and they go, mm, when they see it and let it go, because they right. have important things. We'll take <laughs> We have a gentleman coming on explaining some of the myths. For example, you mentioned Paul Revere. I mentioned Betsy Ross. Were things that were kind of public relations stunts that really never happened and had a discolored history a little bit. We'll be right back after this. Tom Burnham is with us tonight. He is a... Uh, Tom Burnham is a professor of English at Portland State University in uh, Portland, Oregon, and he has compiled a, an amusing and very informative books called The Dictionary of Misinformation, which is a, a miscellany of misbeliefs and things that we have accepted as fact and so forth. Some of them have to do with the bicentennial. Would you welcome, please, Tom Burnham. You know each other, yes. I got caught in midair. Yeah. I am sorry. <laughs> Which of these myths and misinformative statements should we shatter first? It's almost, uh, you know, you, you grow up believing things all your yeah, life, now you read this and... Uh, let's talk about the bicentennial. All right, go ahead. Oh. One thing that you said at the beginning, by the way, was quite good. You said that Horace Greeley was reputed to have said, go west, young man, and you're quite correct, he didn't say it. He didn't say that? No, a young man in Indianapolis or Indiana said it. And Greeley stole it, you mean? Greeley, well, he didn't steal it. He didn't say he said it, but uh, everybody else said he did. So they attributed it to Horace, <laughs> yes, Horace yes, Greeley. Horace Greeley. Now, how about Betsy Ross and the, and the American flag? Well, I didn't know that Levi Strauss had actually. I was very well, interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, hadn't heard that myself. No, the story was told as late as 1870, in time for the first centennial, by one of her uh, descendants who read a paper in Philadelphia, and the story, so far as I know, has never been corroborated by anyone else, so I'm a little suspicious of it myself. Yeah. We tend to romanticize our oh, historical yes. backgrounds a good deal, to, mm -hmm. to glamorize them somewhat, mm -hmm. and, and some of our leaders, which uh, seems to be rather chic nowadays to go back and mm -hmm. pick out public figures and show their peccadillos and uh, <laughs> yes. uh, that they are <laughs> too mortal far like back everybody. Either, uh, yes, we'll so. go back just a few <laughs> years. But like George Washington now and all yes. of the things you see and throwing the dollar across the Potomac. Mm -hmm. Did you ever research that? Oh, yes, yes. And in the first place, he wasn't raised on the Potomac, but on the Rappahannock, which uh, tends to destroy the story a bit. And of course, the currency was British. He may have thrown a pound note. I don't know. I, but he could not have thrown a dollar, no. <laughs> why, did you just, why did you decide to write this book? Just because? Uh, well, uh, you're up to your, let's say, ears and misinformation if you teach as long as I have. And then some time ago, I wrote a little piece for the 